going to go through an overview of InfoWorks 360. My name is Melanie Santer with USCAD. I just want to cover real quick, we've got parts two and three of this. this is a three-part webinar series. I want to make sure everyone's aware and make sure everyone has the time to get signed up. On May 1st, on Thursday, we've got another webinar at the same time, 11 a.m., on Autodesk vehicle tracking. And then on May 8th at 10.30 a.m., we have Keep Civil Engineering Projects on Budget with Bluebeam Review. The link is right here to register online. So if you guys are able to register for that, that would be fantastic. I don't want to bore you too much. I want to uh, go ahead and pass this over to Angel Espinoza with Autodesk. He's going to be giving you guys the presentation on InfoWorks 360. Thanks so much. And Angel, the screen is all yours. I'm sorry, I was on mute. Uh, <laughs> Melanie, uh, can you see my screen okay? Absolutely, I sure do. Fantastic. Well, sorry about that, everyone. Uh, welcome once again to the webinar. As Melanie stated, uh, she had already presented these, uh, these first couple of slides. So my portion of today then will be to discuss the, what we refer to as the Autodesk planning solutions and now preliminary design solutions. InfoWorks 360 and its vertical applications, and certainly we want to talk a little bit about just a, a term called InfoWorks in general because sometimes there's a little bit of confusion for people. So as was mentioned, my name is Angel Espinoza. I am a technical specialist for Autodesk. been with the company about six years, focusing on the entire infrastructure design suite products and InfoWorks in particular as well. So today what uh, we'll find out is what InfoWorks allows us to do basically it allows us to more easily communicate design intent. So traditionally, if you can see in the uh, image in the upper right-hand corner there what's being shared, it's not uncommon for people to present their information in the form of static images and storyboards, etc. Well, one of the things that quite commonly happens is um, people sometimes have a little bit of difficulty understanding, making sense of all of the, the very static images because they may want to see something from a particular point of view, maybe from their particular property or from what uh, their line of sight would be as they enter into any particular project area, whether that be buildings or dams or bridges or highways, whatever the case may be. Well, also additionally, uh, very commonly as data, in, in the next image just below that, as data more progresses, we'll see that there is a typical loss of data as the next phase of development has to recreate that data, repurpose that data for their own usage. And what we're hoping then is, with the second bullet you see there, is enhanced design workflow so that information that is begun in a very conceptual state can then easily move into the preliminary design stages, ultimately to detail design, and as that goes perhaps into construction documentation, maybe all the way into the construction end of the, of the project timelining, then we will have this same data to work with without or at least the minimal amount of translation as possible. And then lastly, that last image uh, attempts to show the, the type of imagery we can potentially expect. This definitely differentiates organizations that are creating images that are very realistic uh, animations and like, likewise that are you can create drive-throughs, walk-throughs, fly-throughs that are significantly more visually impactful than perhaps we would have from a static uh, board or presentation item of some, of some sort, and then thus differentiate uh, our individual companies and hopefully in order to win more work. Okay, with that said, um, InfraWorks, let's talk a little bit about InfraWorks. If we look at the icons, the images on the right-hand side, we'll see that ultimately InfraWorks is able to do what that first uh, bullet says, aggregate a great deal of data. So whether we're talking about GIS data, aerial data, survey data, whether it be traditional uh, Kobo points or LIDAR information, CAD data of various file formats, and ultimately model data, right, BIM data of various file formats, all can be brought together into a singular environment and thus create a much more visually impactful 
the representation of whatever it is that we're discussing. So from that then aggregated model, we can do what some of the other items and some of the other bullets indicate there. We can then easily, of course, get to the visualization aspect of our model. We can then begin to do some ana analysis of the model. I apologize, my uh, Windows is trying to convert my color scheme, so I'm going to try to prevent that from happening. There we go. I should not see that message again. Um, from an analysis perspective, we can do some things with that model. We can then run some simulations. We will be able to import quite a number of different file formats, as was already indicated, Revit, Civil 3D, Navisworks, Bentley Products, SketchUp. We can export back to Civil 3D. We'll see that there's a, a very specific file format that allows me to take data once created here in either a preliminary or even conceptual design state, move that into Civil 3D, or vice versa, bring information in from Civil 3D that's already beyond the preliminary design stage, maybe already at its final design stage, and we wish to bring it over here for a final uh, uh, presentation or visualization. And supports conceptual, as I indicated, supports conceptual to preliminary design. That's a very important uh, item to focus on for a second in that it doesn't matter where and at what point of the project life cycle I may wish to utilize a product like InfoWorks, InfoWorks 360, because it supports all of the above. I can certainly use it at its earliest uh, stages and then also at significantly later stages. So InfoWorks, that would be again InfoWorks 360. The other thing about, uh, excuse me, InfoWorks and InfoWorks 360, the other thing about this product that's very interesting is that InfoWorks, I'll refer to as InfoWorks scalability. It is very scalable. So whether we're creating information for uh, very small sites, similar to what we see in the upper left-hand corner, a single house on a, on a you know, small residential street perhaps, and wishing to show detail about right down to uh, the plants or the faucets even on, in the front yard, all of that can be shown very easily. But if we have to then model or create information and share information at larger scale, so whether we're talking about blocks, city blocks, uh, entire cities, or even above and beyond entire cities, entire regions, that this product scales very well and is capable of handling both the very finite detail of a small model and the very large amounts of data required for very large models. So let's then focus just a second on the differences between InfraWorks and InfraWorks 360 because some people are a little bit confused by that and we've certainly uh, kind of uh, added to the problem just by naming them so similarly, but want to make sure that everyone's clear on that. Some of you, as a matter of fact, may already own licenses of InfraWorks because it did ship and does ship with the Infrastructure Design Suite Premium, Infrastructure Design Suite Ultimate, and also the Building Design Suite Ultimate. So those would be the, what I'll refer to as InfraWorks. Some people are referred to it as InfraWorks, kind of a standalone or desktop version. Um, and now I wish to differentiate that with InfraWorks 360. It's not included in any of the suites. It is a completely separate purchase. We refer to it as a desktop subscription meaning people would purchase it for a period of time, a subscription, but it does, in fact, install on your desktop like, like the other one. But it, these are the following differences. The first major difference is that InfraWorks 360 is able to utilize the cloud in many, many ways, one of which is this new capability called Model Builder. It's currently in a preview, in a preview state, and I'll show you how that works in just a moment. But basically, it allows us to very simply to, uh, as a matter of fact, I can even just kind of start the process here in just a moment. I'll start the video running in the background. Um, to identify a portion of a map and then to um, ask it to build a model from already available data sources that we've made and, and gathered together. So uh, some of them you see here are the USDA, USGS, OpenStreetMap data. Currently it is limited to, by the way, only the continental United States but we hope to be able to expand that uh, in the near term. And it automatically generates a model for us. We'll see that in an in, in example in just a sec uh, of the selected area. And it stores it up in the cloud in InfoWorks 360. And then it, within 15 minutes, typically significantly less than that, I get a little email that tells me it's ready and then I can download and I've already done that. And we can start with one of those as an example. Now the other thing that differentiates InfraWorks 360 from InfraWorks, the, the one that's in the suites, is that the ability to collaborate. So if we look at some of these sub-capabilities, absolutely, what we can do then in, with InfraWorks 360, we can publish our model up into the cloud so that I can share that with other people. 
I can also publish portions of that model, they're called scenarios, up into the cloud so that other people can view those portions, these scenarios, either with a web browser or with an iPad. So in the upper middle, we see they're using and, and accessing that scenario on an iPad, absolutely possible. Again, this is part of InfoWorks 360, this collaboration capability. And the InfoWorks iPad app, we see there in the bottom center, to uh, then interact with that, that, that scenario, that portion of, a, of an overall lot. Um, and again, as I mentioned, it also is possible to interact with that same thing, just in a simple web browser with no additional software installed. Lastly, InfoWorks 360 um, takes full advantage of the design feed, which is quite common now in quite a number of the Autodesk products. So that people that are viewing any, either on the iPad or in the web browser, or perhaps that I give access to the model from the cloud, can provide feedback in a, in a much more interactive uh, design process. Okay, additionally, InfoWorks 360 is the only version of InfoWorks that can have vertical applications added on top of that. There are currently two vertical applications that can be purchased. These would be the two on the left here. Um, I apologize, they're a little bit small to read, but you'll see them a little bit more clearly in just a moment. That would be the, the uh, bridge design for InfraWorks 360, that is the full name. Uh, Autodesk uh, roadway design for InfraWorks 360. Those then could be add on, added on to InfraWorks 360, and we'll see how those are utilized in just a moment as part of the demonstration. And there is a third add-on, basically, vertical application, currently free. People. It, 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 they can utilize it right now for free. There's no, no charge for its use at the moment. It is in its previous state. And that's called drainage design, again, for InfoWorks 360, right? So these three only install themselves on InfoWorks 360, and that's, that truly differentiates the product. So let's go ahead and jump right into the product, and then we'll have a better understanding of what we're talking about. So for starters, I am now in InfoWorks 360, and up here in the upper left-hand corner, I'm going to go ahead and initiate the model builder and just talk very briefly then how this works. As I indicated, it's limited to the continental United States, and I'll pick a, uh, an office here. I'm going to zoom into the area where I think Mel Melanie's uh, headquarters is located. Um, let's see here. We'll zoom in here, right near John Wayne Airport, as a matter of fact, and close to Mesa. I'm right in here. And then you can see I can zoom in and zoom out. Uh, I can resize and reconfigure re the size of the window or shape of the window. But in the upper left-hand corner, it's telling me how much area am I currently looking at. I've seen approximately 2.73 square kilometers. Um, currently in its preview state, this is limited to about 150 square kilometers. And then below that, it's telling me the types of data that are available to me. Again, once, once again, the uh, national elevation data for terrain data uh, of various types, geo reference, ground imagery, uh, roads, rail, water features, rivers, uh, oceans, and in some areas, buildings, but that is limited to where there are free buildings and not all municipalities yet have made their building footprints available in a freeway. So uh, some areas of the country have really nice, uh, lots of amounts of buildings that we can utilize. Some areas are much more sparse than that. So basically, I assign this to a group. I give it a name. I tell it to create a model. And then I get a little message that says, within 15 minutes, your model will be ready. And when I did that earlier today, well, about three minutes later, I received notification that this model, which I named US CAD Newport Beach, was available. And here it is up in this portion is basically the cloud. And these are the models that I've stored up in the cloud. And then once I've done, I select it, it then downloads onto my local machine. And this is what I got straight out of the box. Actually, I'm going to change one thing here, master. I'm going to go back to a proposal called master, and we'll understand the differences between proposals in just a moment. This is exactly what I got straight out of the box from the cloud when I chose to download it. Now, um, a relatively flat portion, uh, there I do see in this area there is some relief. I see some uh, uh, a natural wildlife area. So there is a little bit of relief, and we'll see a little bit more how I can tell the detail of that relief in just a moment. There are some roads. If I pick a, a smaller intersection right in here, I'm going to zoom in on that. Um, ultimately, we do see that these roads, which were ultimately at one point probably just shape files, were introduced and turned into full 3D roads. So they do have, in this case, uh, curb face, curb top, there's some green space and sidewalks, et cetera. Now, what I, I wish to indicate, uh, all roads are currently stylized exactly the same, whether they're larger boulevards or uh, small streets, freeways but there are, are both 
simple ways to either manually make edits, or there are style-based style rules or rules that I can apply that would say, change the style of certain roads because of certain properties of the roads that came with the original shape file, so um, I can make things bigger or smaller. Now, what I've already gone ahead and done, and I'm going to introduce then the, the capabilities of what are referred to as proposals. I've already created my first proposal, so I took master, which every InfraWorks model will contain, master, and by and large, for most people, that's often considered the existing condition. And I created the one called Master Plus because um, I was able to locate uh, free online some re geo reference ground imagery that was a little bit higher resolution. So I went ahead and dropped that in in addition. Um, and I didn't point out that in the master there were no building footprints. Well, there might have been actually two buildings so now that I see those over there. But in the area of the CAD, uh, the US CAD, um, offices, there were no buildings. So I went ahead and just added a few buildings here very quickly. I added a couple of trees, a couple of cars in the parking lot, just to, to indicate here I've already modified this proposal. Now a proposal, as we'll soon see, can represent a couple of different things, which can be either different types or different appearances of a design, which we're going to then identify a, a piece of land here, and we're going to do a design right on it. So. Uh, a proposal can be either different types of designs, different types of usage for the land, or it could be different phases of development or say that project or asset over time, right? Maybe phase one, phase two, phase three. Uh, same, same design just evolving over time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and create a new proposal from that one, and I'll call this alternative, alternative zero one. So what we're going to then do is trying to do some sort of design in this particular uh, piece of property, and then we'll make some decisions about how that will ultimately be utilized. And that, in doing so, we'll learn a great deal about how this product can be used. So one of the simple things, then, is the uh, user interface. This is now referred to as a, an immersive user interface. For those of you that have already interacted with InfoWorks, you may remember there was a ribbon across the top. And here the intent is to make this a little bit simpler to use and perhaps a little bit less uh, obtrusive, uh, hopefully that, that allows for people to do more of what they want uh, more quickly. So here, these icons then basically are the InfraWorks 360 base and then the, the road design extension added on to it. And road design for InfraWorks 360, that would be this, this brown icon and everything that it adds. The purplish one would be the bridge design extension and everything that it adds. The uh, aqua blue would be the drainage design. And then these last two are, again, back to the, what InfoWorks creates. So let's learn a little bit more about InfoWorks. The first thing I want to point out is that InfoWorks is able to aggregate, as was indicated earlier, quite a number of different file formats. Here would be the vast majority of some of those. And um, we can see here, that like if I start at the bottom, things like SketchUp, SQLite, Shape, et cetera, et cetera. And we see little icons to the left of them. Now, in some cases, there are little clouds. And in some cases, there's just a little screen. And that helps me understand, if I were to use and introduce a SketchUp model, then the way I currently have it configured, it would utilize the cloud to make sense of that model and then drop it into my uh, environment here. Um, it's also possible to configure that. So if I have Navisworks, Navisworks can likewise make intelligent sense of a great deal of files, including SketchUp. And I can also configure it to not utilize the cloud and perhaps use Navisworks if I have that present. So I just wanted to point that out here. So it is possible then to aggregate lots of data. And here we see then the data that came automatically. And then I added one of the images myself, which was that higher resolution image. So let's then start creating or what it refers to as sketching some of the capabilities. So I wish to point out, because of one of the capabilities that InfoWorks is capable of doing, is sketching roads. So I'm going to go ahead and sketch a road. And by default, it's asking me automatically, well, pick a style for a road. And I'll go ahead and pick a style. That's fine. And then I'm going to sketch a road. But I want to very, very, the purpose of doing this is to point out the difference between a sketched road, which I can quite honestly follow illogical design um, considerations, and then uh, join that over to that one. And I was able to create that 
sketched road, but you'll see that based on that chicane, basically, that I added into the middle of that, there was no design limitations for me to do that. And you can see that I can come back in here and then reconfigure that road uh, again, without any limitations. And th this would be the sketching ability. If I were to remove both of those vertices, uh, certainly then it would be possible to, to design something that, or, or to sketch something that would look somewhat perhaps passable as to how it would ultimately build the design. But with the sketch mode, I, I just wish to point out that there are no limitations. And we'll do a, uh, a, a design road here in just a moment. So just wanted to point out that it's certainly possible to sketch roads. Now before I start to sketch buildings, I'm going to jump a little bit lower and sketch a coverage object. And what a coverage object can be utilized to do is uh, two things. One is to very simply just apply materials. So I'm going to go ahead and, and sketch then this coverage object here. And if I had a boundary or a property limit or anything along those lines, which I just hit another bike button, I didn't mean to, let's do that again. Um, I could then introduce the um, that boundary, that property line, and just apply it, apply it as a coverage object so that I could then colorize it a particular way or apply materials to it in a particular way. So maybe I'm just going to very quickly then sketch what I anticipate is going to be the limits of this particular project here. And maybe right to about there. And I'll give you a quick tip on how to utilize this product. You basically pick, 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 double pick when you're done, and that will then apply the object. And that's applied for buildings and waters and trees and everything. So all I've done for the moment is basically I applied this coverage object, and you can see kind of a little bit from the shadowing or shading that all it has done is basically draped itself on the surface, and, and uh, it is following the existing contours of the ground. Now, when I mentioned that it's possible to use different materials, I will go ahead and see here. I'm going to bring up my styles palette. And similar to Civil 3D, I suppose, there's quite a number of uh, use of the term styles. And one of them is all of these different materials. And we'll see uh, in just a moment for buildings, there are facades and for roads, there's road styles, etc. I'll start off with the, the uh, materials. And there are some city block materials. And there are some land land cover materials. And if I just very simply drag and drop one of these materials, maybe I wanted to represent that as entirely open fields or grass. I chose tall grass. So as I zoom in on that, we'll see then that I represented and applied that that tall grass style over the entire, uh, in this case, property. If I drag in another style like manicured grass, it would look differently. If I drag and drop river stone. Again, it'll look differently. There's lots of materials, loose gravels, asphalts, concrete, uh, tiles, and cobblestones, lots of different types of materials. And, and very simply, I can drag and drop those things on there. Now, the other thing that's interesting is I can use that same exact coverage object. And here, I'll do it perhaps in a slightly different location to interact with the landform. So if I were to then go back and create another coverage object, I can pick an area. Let's pick a coverage object right there. Pick an area. Uh, I'm going to do this non-rectangular on purpose. And then I can choose that coverage object. And let's say one of the options, if I right click, is to shape the terrain. This would then allow me to move this up and down. And in this case, I created a, a low point. Right? If I lift it up, I can create a high point, a mound, uh, et cetera. Now, uh, it is also possible individually edit the vertices. And just for the sake of this demonstration for just a moment, I'm going to grab about maybe two of these vertices and push them down. So you can see that I've, I've done something where I uh, lifted up the ground, the existing ground in a couple of areas, and I've actually pushed uh, in uh, other areas uh, down into the ground. And if I wanted to use one of the other colors, let's use the transparent material on that, then I'll leave the ground kind of leave, looking like it would but just I've used this transparent color just to be able to apply that coverage to manipulate the landform. So I, we can see then we're, it's, we're, it's possible to begin to sketch objects like these coverage objects. But additionally, one of the things that's possible is to do what is referred to as um, some sort of analysis. Now, I'm going to come over here to the ana analysis tab, the analyze tab, and I'm going to create a couple of terrain themes right on the fly. So one of them is to create a theme. And I'll just call it uh, ELED for elevation. Elevational banding, it's going to use six colors. It's going to go from red to blue. And I'll hit OK. And then we can see that based on the elevational values, 
where this terrain then is lower, and then there was that little ravine kind of that I mentioned. There's some lower lands and some uh, slightly elevated lands, and it basically goes from about zero to 19 in its original form. But uh, you can see because I pushed it down, maybe I want to use down to like minus 20 and to positive, uh, let's put a positive 30. And then it immediately recolorizes a lot. You can push it down more than 20 feet. You can see the color's not applied. Okay, so uh, elevational banding, and I'll, I'll go ahead and turn that off. The next thing is that maybe I wish to do a slope analysis. And as I'm designing, maybe to understand these slope analysis could be an important consideration. So there are some slope uh, capabilities. And here I'll use one of the straight out of the box themes, color themes. And it's basically going to be somewhat transparent white and then transitioning from blue, green, yellow, red as things get steeper. I'll even apply a little bit of transparency to it so I can see the ground underneath. Hit OK. And then now you'll see that the vast majority of the model is white because it is relatively flat. But where things are a little bit steeper, it transitions into these transparent uh, blues and greens and yellows. I didn't make it so steep, but I get into that 72 to 90 percent range at, uh, in red. So you can see very quick and easy to create. I can double click here and make modifications to that uh, if necessary, certainly possible. I'll just turn that off. But as I'm designing, as I'm moving, as I'm manipulating, let me turn that one back on, as a matter of fact, and then edit that, edit that terrain, um, you can see I'll, keep, I'll get instant feedback on what it is that I'm doing from that kind of preliminary design uh, perspective of the terrain. So if I have, in this case, this land coverage, I'm going to go ahead and hit delete. The ground should snap back to its original form, which was flat. I'll go ahead and turn off that analysis. So we see, once again, that InfoWorks is absolutely capable of creating um, creating objects and doing some analytical capabilities. Man, many more analytical capabilities, as it turns out. But uh, based on time, we'll just, just kind of limit ourselves to those two. Now, uh, additionally, let's say we wanted to develop this piece of land. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to place in now uh, some roads. Now, instead of the InfoWorks kind of sketched roads, I'm now going to use the InfoWorks 360 extension that is called Road Design for InfoWorks 360. So here, when I choose to design roads, I, um, currently there's four levels of roads that I can design, uh, basically highways. They have their own design speed, arterials, collectors, and local roads. So I'm going to choose local road. And again, I could pick a style. And I'll go ahead and pick the same style that's currently being utilized. But we'll see how simple that is to change after the fact. And maybe my intent will be to start over here. Uh, start there, and then I'll design. Now I'm designing, right? So unlike the sketching earlier, you see now as I'm dragging or as I'm picking my next uh, PI, point of inflection, I'm seeing the tangent sections of the road will be in black. The radial sections of the road or the curves will be in blue. And I see the PI location in yellow. I see the tangents coming off the PI. So this, I see the design speed also, by the way, there in the little tooltip that's telling me 30 miles an hour. So based on the 30 miles per hour ASHTO design table, I am limited then to the, the, the curvature of that road. So I cannot create the chicane like I did with the sketchy roads that I did earlier. So I'll go ahead and pick a point here, maybe pick a point over here, and then lastly bring this around. And I'm going to maybe merge this back into there. And when, if I pick my points kind of close, well enough from far away, uh, it will create intersections. I see I created an intersection on that side. This one I might have missed it by just a touch. So let me go ahead and fix that really quickly. I'll adjust it. There we go. And now I have intersections at both sides. But now this is these are design roads. These are not the sketchy roads that InfoWorks by itself creates. These are the design roads that InfoWorks, excuse me, that the this road design extension, road design for InfoWorks 360 is capable of then creating. Now if I turn this on its side, we can see a little bit more about how this was utilized. And ultimately, I can grab that road. And again, with the analytical capabilities of the road extension, I can bring up the profile view. So here, I can see then the existing ground in green on the bottom. Hopefully, that's visible to everyone. And the, um, let me make sure that I'm going to check my panel, see if I'm getting any notes of any sort. Uh, nope, looks good. Um, so now I'm interacting with this in a profile view. So one of the things I can do is come down here and grab that profile uh, PI point, and you can see that as I'm moving it around in the profile view, 
that up above my basically the center line of that road is in fact changing. So if I if I basically then drive across the tops of that ridge and not go down into the bottom of that ravine and place that right about there, then I've now based, designed a road straight across the tops of that uh, ravine without uh, and and I have them this daylighting right this state line capability that's going down. So absolutely I can now then design per ASHTO standards both horizontally and vertically passing site distance, not stopping site distance, all that can take into account. As a matter of fact, uh, over here we have some other capabilities. So some of that would actually push this information up into the cloud, be where the, the these the cloud then throws many, many servers at the particular question or, or request, and then we get solutions back very quickly, far quicker than we would typically get uh, from a single desktop application. Now, uh, additionally, what I'm going to do very quickly here is I'm going to create another design road. And what happens when design roads cross, I'll create another road here, create another local road, and maybe just very simply cross from there to there. And where design roads cross, we now have something kind of similar to what InfraWorks is capable of, because InfraWorks is capable of creating an intersection to get to a fair, but this is an intersection object that only takes place where two design roads cross. This intersection object then is a very intelligent capability, and here we see what's called an asset card uh, that deals with this intersection object. So it says it's a turning zone, and there is um, a design vehicle currently set up as a passenger vehicle, and I can cycle through various design vehicles. And I pick something rather large or sizable, that intersection will change so that the curb returns, in this case, it will accommodate something of that size. Now, if I come back to the passenger vehicle, it resizes itself. Now, any corner, I can pick any quadrant of that uh, intersection and begin to do things. So one of the things, maybe, if I grab or hover over this grip here along the left side to me, uh, as I pull this back, it said adding a widening. So I can then add in either a deceleration lane or a right turn only pocket, et cetera, and, and specify that. Right. Uh, additionally, I can come to the other side of this and maybe, again, maybe add a merge lane or maybe the opposite side of the street, add an extra lane through the intersection before it merges down to or constricts down to less lanes. So what we're able to then do is using now true design standards and true design specifications uh, apply some of these uh, properties that we want. Now, if necessary, I can come in here to this blending area and it says the transition length. There's a length there that I can modify. And then the transition type, if I drop that down, we can see we can go from curve, tangent, curve, uh, curve, curve, or with a, with a reverse curve, or curve and the reverse curve. Lots of ways that I can make that uh, particular curve return very uh, precisely what I want. There I chose the curve, curve, reverse curve, etc or just single rules or, or again sending it back to me. So you can see that it, it updates all of those things on the fly. And so that's what we get when we start talking about road design, then this ability to do a, a far above and beyond what InfraWorks is capable of doing in, in doing true ASHTO road design capabilities. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there is the ability to I'll come over here to this uh, little monitor which is create and conduct InfraWorks design presentations. Uh, it's actually the next one, the little crossing uh, wrench and screwdriver. And this uh, are the utilities, settings and utilities. And one of the utilities is to export to IMX. You can see that uh, right here. I apologize for the white on the gray background. But uh, the export IMX then would be taking advantage of that purpose-built IMX file format that allows me to take data from InfraWorks and take it back into Civil 3D. Or take data from InfraWorks, and I can export to IMX on the Civil 3D side, excuse me, working in Civil 3D, export to IMX, and then I can import that IMX file into here, and that was one of the items that was on the data sources. right? So again, a very purpose-built file format that basically ties these two applications, InfraWorks and Civil 3D, very closely to one another. So um, again, irrespective of where the data originates and where the design originates, I can quickly move that design into the other application to take best advantage of that other application, whether it's creating construction documents in Civil 3D or creating a nice uh, asset for sharing or collaborating with others 
um, whether images and videos as we'll see before we're even done today. Now to continue, uh, we're, we're going to be doing some other uh, site creation here in just a moment, but I'd already done the road design, so let me then add in here the bridge design. So as I had mentioned, uh, the road design capabilities were basically this brown icon. The bridge design is this purplish icon. And because I have that installed or available to me, I can just come down here to the road, right mouse click, and choose to add a bridge. You'll remember there was a ravine there. As a matter of fact, that kind of little stream is going right at the bottom of that ravine. So I'll choose to add a bridge. And very simply, this is going to ask me, well, specify, specify the start point, specify the end point, and just with two simple clicks, it then has added in a bridge. Now, for the sake of uh, kind of clarity, what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply a transparent color back to that ground so that I can see through it and you can see the natural ground underneath there. There we go. And now we're going to look at this bridge a little bit more in detail. Okay. So as I go in here, one of the things we'll notice is that bridge, um, aside from the top, but let's, let's focus on the below structure, there is an abutment at either side. Here we see the one on the left side. Uh, there is a, a, uh, a pier. There is, it does have a cap, and there are bearings. And as a matter of fact, if I were to turn, uh, turn the ground, let me do the, on the display side here, we'll turn the ground opacity off, or make it more slightly more transparent we'll see that there's actually pilings, or if I go below, below ground, you'll see that there's actually pilings that are part of that bridge design. Now, if I touch the bridge right here, and I'm looking at the entire bridge, there's, again, a bridge asset card. And that bridge asset card tells me that I use one of the two types of bridges that it's capable of creating, in this case, the steel plate girder bridge. And additionally, I'm going to right-click on that and ask for quantities. So here are the quantities, then, of what it took to design that particular bridge. Now, let's say right now there's two piers, and I can come over here and up that number. Excuse me, there's one pier, one pier. Change it to two, and now it redesigned itself to two piers. And the quantities will have changed to accommodate the, that new design. Or there's two types of girder bridges that it can use at the moment. One is the steel plate girder bridge, which is what it would like that uh, it's in place at the moment, or I can use the precast eye girders, and as soon as I do that, it's going to redesign itself, and, and again, now it's back to a single pier, and all of the quantities now, we can see that there's values over here in the precast area, where a moment ago there were not any. So the, let me turn the opacity back on, the bridge design then allows us very, I'm going to turn my ambient occlusion, that should help us see that a little bit better. Um, Bridge design capability allows us to then utilize very simple mechanisms to create very detailed bridges. As I get in here close, you can see the, the detail of that particular bridge. Now, if I were needing to grab that particular pier based on maybe there's a roadway underneath, absolutely, I can not only slide the pier, and you'll see that the gaps and locations of the precast uh, beams beneath it will adjust to that. But also, if that pier needs to, again, perhaps skew because of the nature of what's underneath it, it went from two columns to three columns just because of this additional length of it being skewed. I bring it back to this location, uh, it, it goes back to being two columns, right? And the quantity is all updated because of that. So the bridge design capability absolutely allows us to do probably what has been referred to as about 80, 80 to 90 percent of uh, representations of bridges in the U.S., which are typical just girder bridges over smaller uh, streams, rivers, and roadways. So um, let me just talk a couple of more moments about the road design, and then we'll get on back to InfoWorks and what it's capable of doing, just because to, I'll make this look a little bit nicer. Now, it is possible with the road design here, we'll see that I can interact with the geometry. and if I were to grab certain vertices, if I'm more in a horizontal perspective, I see the vertical curve grips. If I go back to more of a plan view perspective, the grips are now more uh, for the horizontal alignment, horizontal design. Uh, additionally, it says edit mode. I'm in the geom geometric mode, geometry mode. But I can also do things now that I, were not possible before. 
my tabs are called style zone. I can change the number of lanes forward, number of lanes backwards, and I can do and modify the roadside grading uh, very quickly and easily. So if I choose to add, let's say, a lane forward, I'll do that quickly right here. Uh, a lane forward, I'm going to add another lane in this particular zone, maybe from here to here, here to here. Uh, I want to add in another lane, so we'll take the lane numbers and we'll increase that by one, and then we'll see that I have either a passing lane or a turnout lane or whatever the case may be uh, in that, uh, certainly a widening in that area. Now, one of the other things that was possible, as I mentioned, was the style, to represent the style of the road without breaking the road in, in previous versions of InfoWorks or in the this, the plain version of InfoWorks that's not 360, I would have to break the road in order to have it look differently in di at different points, basically change its style. But now I can take this road, uh, and, and as was mentioned, I'm going to add in a, a style zone. And let's pick a different style here for the bridge representation. And I'm going to split that from maybe there to there. And now I've applied that style of road without breaking the road just to that segment of the road. So now I have the above deck uh, style coinciding with the below uh, deck bridge design so that I have something that's very realistic. And I apologize for uh, zooming and panning. I just was hoping to uh, give you a, a, a different perspective on that. OK, so coming back, let's, let's then develop our site a little bit more before we begin to share. I see I'm doing a time check. We have about 18 minutes and want to allow also a little bit for questions if possible. So coming back here, then I'm going to apply that land cover uh, material once again of some sort, uh, with styles palette, going to my materials. Maybe, maybe we're going to asphalt all of that. So if I go to my roadway styles, there's concrete and asphalts and brickwork that are typical of roads. Um, let's let's do black asphalt over the entire thing. It certainly brings to mind one of the uh, I think there was a song right about paving paradise. So I, I've applied this asphalt over the entire area. And let's then decide that in a certain region, maybe asphalt is not good. Let's, uh, let's do it. No, I'll leave it in asphalt more. So let's then design something right here. Maybe then the intent will be on this area, I'm now going to create a building. So just like I did everything else, I can specify a style of a building. I'll specify the footprint of the building. And again, I don't want it to be perfectly rectangular it's because it's so show better. I've now specified a particular building. And just as in the past, it, it, with everything else, I see the, the, uh, the grips that specify its, its footprint. And you can see I can quickly make modifications to that. Let's, let's make it like this. Uh, I can remove vertices. I can add vertices. I can rotate the entire building around if necessary. Let's orient it maybe like that and then make sure that we're right about there. OK, now I can also grab the grip at the top and change the height of the building. The number of floors will either increase or decrease appropriately so that per the facade, that building will look correct based on what I need. Now, if uh, someone is ultimately designing a building, it's absolutely possible to bring in SketchUp buildings, to bring in Revit buildings, as we had talked a little bit about earlier. And these might be placeholders. Or I could very simply grab that building if someone wishes to just see a massing of that building, I can remove the style to that building and just create a massing here. And we'll see basically just the, the uh, somewhat rectangular shape of that building now with no detail, no, no, uh, yeah, no detail. So I'm going to undo that, apply the style back there. Now maybe the intent would be to add something like a water feature nearby or some trees. Again, very simple to do, a stand of trees. How do I do so? You, you probably are now well familiar with how this is done. Pick, 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 pick. I create any shape I wish. Double pick when I'm done. Now, in this case of trees, those will come in here in just a second. There we are. In the case of trees, uh, I have a little slider right here in the cent center that allows me to either densify or simplify the amount of trees on the ground. I'm going to go ahead and apply more trees to that area. Additionally, I have this cone on top, which allows me to make them taller, more mature. And then now I've densified that stand of trees and added significantly more trees in that area. Now, there's lots of ways to make it a mixture of various species of trees, not the least of which are the rules that I specified earlier. But for the moment, I apply kind of just universal standard trees in that area. Now, another thing that may be necessary or wanted would be maybe a water feature. 
Um, I'll place water right here in the middle of this asphalt, just because I can. I'll choose a water area, and I'll pick one of the styles that are available to me there. And I'll then very quickly pick the shape of the water. I'm not going to make it round or rectangular, kind of bean or oval shape here, so that if I were to choose to modify it, I would uh, easily see its orientation. Now, uh, I'm going to zoom into this area, and I'm, I'm, I'm just noticing right here that I do see that I'm in the shadow area of the building. So let me, let me, as I throw these last couple of objects on here, I just want to talk just momentarily also about shadows and the sky, etc. So I, one of my workflows is I tend to put these inverted cones here, um, depending upon where I want objects. So I'll place a cone there and another cone there. And I tend to like to go and use the uh, styles palette that I pointed out earlier and just drag and drop things out of there. So when it comes to 3D models, there's quite a number of 3D models straight out of the box. If I start at the bottom, down here there's some, a collection of vehicles, which I'll make them a little bit larger. And there's, there's a decent assortment of vehicles, but not what I would call an unlimited assortment. And that then often uh, begs the question, is it possible to add one's own library of 3D objects? And it absolutely is very simple, and it's almost expected that you would want to be able to introduce your modeled uh, library of objects or perhaps things that you acquire either free or via purchase on the internet so that they can introduce, be introduced onto these things called palettes, and then you just very simply drag and drop them, right? So if I wanted a car, if, uh, here's a red uh, BMW, I'll drag and drop it onto that cone. Did I miss it? I can hit the road, I'm sorry, hit undo, make sure. Yeah, it looks like I replaced the road with car. Let's do that again. Uh, drag it onto that cone. There we go. And now that car got placed. And I'll reorient the car so it's driving down the street, very narrow street. We can see how we'll adjust those in just a moment. And then over here off to the side, what do we want? Do we want a person walking? Do we want a, uh, uh, so down here under the people, I have people. I'll place a person walking right there. Uh, behind the sidewalk in this case. I think it became too fast. We replaced the asphalt with a person. There we go. Put that on that cloned object. And now, again, I can have him walking towards the building or parallel with the sidewalk, just orient him around. Not a problem. I put him on the sidewalk, of course, if necessary. And so there, at this very human scale, very close, infinite scale, I can then place objects. And again, whether those be trees, and I didn't point out that there's plenty of other objects in here. So city furniture is referred to. We'll see mailboxes and newspaper stands, fire hydrants, etc. There's some traffic uh, related objects, construction related objects. So we're, we're talking uh, signs, let's go to the construction. You can see construction equipment, excavators and haulers, all of that. And so there's there are a fair amount of objects straight out of the box, as I mentioned, but easy to, to add more. Now, as we were talking about uh, a moment ago, the shadows of this building, uh, I want to then try to get down here at, I suppose, eye level or back out here a little bit. And then I want to point out the sky, and then we see the shadows there. Now, if I were to go to an overhead view, uh, ultimately, we will see if I begin to back out, and I apologize, this will take just a moment of refreshing and you're in. As I back out far enough, we will ultimately see where that model is on the planet, so where that information resides on a geoid that is uh, the planet Earth. And as you'll see now, I'm able to spin that planet right around. Right? Now, going back to uh, perhaps you're hovering over, looking over the United States, under the display area, there is a, a, one of these asset cards that talks about the sun and sky. So you'll see here that as I change the time of day, basically the Earth is revolving in relationship to the sun, and we'll then have a very accurate representation of sun and shadows based on the time of day and the location of the data on the planet. Additionally, as I change the date of the year, you will see that the, the tilt of the Earth is modeled in relationship to the sun, so that, again, the angle of those shadows are very accurate to the both time and day of the year. So if I go ahead and put this back over here, maybe make it more towards sunset. And if I go zoom back into our model and then look off towards the west, we would ultimately see the setting sun 
uh, in the horizon, and then the, the colors would transition from the bright blues through the yellows and oranges and perhaps deep reds of uh, the sunset uh, time of day that includes sunset. Right? So again, the, the, the ability to create a, a visualization that is very detailed, very accurate. I even have control here, I'll just point it out briefly, over the winds and the clouds, etc. Now, all of this is all well and good, but I need to be able to share this information with others. And as I mentioned, InfoWorks 360 has uh, the ability for me to up publish this entire model up to, by hitting this little synchronize, and pushing my model up into the cloud, basically. The other thing that's possible is I can, with a scenario, identify as much or as little, as I mentioned earlier, as much or as, as little of this design as I wish to send out. So here, I might choose to specify an area of interest. Let me go ahead and pick this, I want to get a rectangular area. This, maybe this is the area of interest that I want, uh, double pick, and then I would create that as a model, excuse me, as a scenario that would be up in the cloud that I wish to share with people. Uh, the other thing that's possible and very easy to do is to create both images, images and animations, and I'll show how quickly that is, even though I only have about eight minutes left in our time, we'll, we'll be able to do uh, all of the above very quickly and very easily. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm looking for, I apologize again for spinning this model around, maybe from the new bridge, I wish to create an image that's looking towards the new building to over show the overall site. So from this display capability, we'll see I'm going to create a snapshot. I can use the uh, viewport resolution, which in my case at the moment is widescreen. I'll place this on my desktop. I'll call this USCAD01. And hit save, and hit save again, and that image gets created that quickly. Now, when it comes to animations, it's almost as simple. And, and people often don't imagine or don't really appreciate at first or yeah, how quick and easy this can be. So I'm going to then go into the storyboard creator, and whatever my first view is, uh, I'm basically going to tell it it's created a new blank storyboard by default. I'm going to tell it, let's create a new camera path animation. So whatever my first view is, that's going to be what's my first, referred to as my first keyframe, and that's generated over here along the left-hand side. Now, for the sake of speed, I'm going to make this the traveling of uh, in this uh, animation rather quick. I'm going to, let's say we're going to fly over this at, let's say, 300 miles an hour. Very quick, just, again, for the sake of speed. So now, at 300 miles an hour, I specify where do I want my next uh, view to be. Maybe I wish to fly close to the bridge, so I'll come down here close to the bridge, and then on the storyboard creator, I'll choose to create right here at another keyframe. So now I'm still less than one second. I'm going to pause there for one second, add some time. I'm now almost at three seconds. And then maybe the next view I want is over here by the building. So we'll come over here by the building. Maybe we'll make a, a low pass by the building. Let's get over there. There we go. Maybe, at, again, at, ice, at street level or eye level, we'll take a look at the car. We'll see the person walking there. And I'll add another keyframe right down here in the bottom. We'll get that. We're now at about five, almost six seconds. We'll pause there for two seconds, one, two. And then maybe I wish to fly out and get another view of the overall site from here. And I'll add that keyframe. I'm now at uh, 11 seconds. So if I choose to play, hit the little play uh, icon right here, and I'll try to move this out of the way. You'll see, and again, I, I, I asked it to do this quickly, but basically it's, it's going through, and I think I even went below ground there for a moment. There we go. I'll take it to move this out of the way here a little bit, and I'll, I'll move that out again. Let's press play. There we go. So I go to the bridge. I pause for one second. I continued. Oh, I did go below ground. I'm over here. Uh, pause for two seconds, and then fly out to my third view. Pause for my third but and for at the end of my my video so you can see though that I was able to create that very quickly I can adjust probably the speed so I don't fly below below ground uh, I could certainly add more keyframes as appropriate now the last icon that I have right here is the ability to export all of that to a video so I'm going to create a Windows media file I'll place this likewise on my desktop and I'll call this uh, US Canada, right? 
Do that double D. Yes, CAD uh, zero Q double D on you. And hit save. And I'll leave that at 25 frames per second. I'll leave it at this smaller res resolution of 800 by 600 versus my screen resolution with the save, the save time. I'll hit the record button, and then it's going to start creating that video in the background. So you'll see that I started that with uh, eight at eight minutes to noon. It's now four minutes to noon, so it took me four minutes to create the animation. It'll probably take another uh, less than a minute for it to fully render that animation. And I now have a video that is completely separate or outside of this environment that I can either post on the website, take that and, and present it in before you know, the appropriate stakeholders, whether they be city council, planning commission, citizen groups, et cetera. We can now create videos and animations very quickly, very easily that would be even perhaps even custom created for that and specific stakeholder from their point of view, from what interests them versus a static board. And there we have the, uh, the video was done. I'll minimize all of this, go back to my desktop. Let me end that presentation for just a moment. And there's the image that I created moments ago. Okay. Nothing canned here. And then here is the video, again, that I created moments ago. It was on my other screen, so we'll move that over. There we go. Let's run that again. It's paused. Slides it up. And, and I certainly appreciate that maybe as that uh, gets translated across the Internet, you may not be seeing it with the same exact fluidity that I'm seeing it at this end, but I guarantee you that that is, in fact, smooth and fluid uh, at my end as that video is created. So let me come back to um, the PowerPoint briefly and just do a, a brief recap of some of the things we've done. Uh, so we had in the demonstration or after the demonstration, we had seen that I'd used the road design for InfraWorks 360, which allowed me to create the intersections. It understands analysis, line of sight analysis, et cetera, and I was able to do uh, both interact with the profile locally. It's also for, able for it to push that information up into the cloud and do long distance profile optimization, both uh, horizontal and vertical as well, uh, alignment optimization in the cloud. We did the bridge design for InfraWorks 360, which uh, did the quantities and it understood uh, basically these different types of girder bridges and how how they need to be designed and designing in context and very quickly and easily. And then I didn't get to the opportunity to demonstrate just because of time the drainage design add-on, but basically it can create uh, culverts for design roads and then also identify watershed areas and do watershed analysis for large regions of terrain. Um, so the primary then differences, of course, being that InfraWorks is capable of, I'll refer to it as sketching. InfraWorks 360 does preliminary design and sharing, collaborating of that information and utilizing the cloud additionally. So today we saw how InfraWorks helps us create visualizations to better communicate those designs to our clients and customers, to project teams, and to other important stakeholders. We also saw uh, to design engineered roads and bridges using the vertical applications. And lastly, we can combine all of these capabilities to get us uh, closer to our completed designs. Right? We, we are not creating something that is a throwaway. This could be utilized with our design tools like Civil 3D very easily and, and very uh, intimately in, in the data transfer. So with that, I think I'm going to ask Melanie, are you on? I'm here. So yeah, this is perfect. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to um, sit in on the presentation. Angel, you did an excellent job. If you guys want some more information, please contact us at USCAD. And we'll also be following up with access to the recording, because this video was recorded. So thanks so much, everyone. Thank you very much, Angel, and have a wonderful day. Take care, everyone.